thanks so much for joining. Um, we're super pleased to have uh, Mitch Young here um, from the season team uh, to talk us through about you know staffing and hiring, what's going on in the restaurant industry. Um, he's you know definitely an expert in the field, uh, given that he's an, an operator, but also working on the technology side. And you know we're going to go into you know, all all sorts of different topics. Um, in terms of yeah, what restaurants can do to, to retain and, and hire the best people, um, the role that technology plays, and yeah, you know the best practices that you can share. So, um, I mean, to kick it off, Mitch would love to you know get a quick intro of, of yourself, um, what you're up to at Season, and um, your, your 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 path to the restaurant industry. Yeah, absolutely, Tim. Thanks for having me too. Uh, it's you know an honor to be here and to be able to kind of at least shed some light on obviously an industry problem um, and a time that is tumultuous to say the least for a lot of restaurants. Um, this is not an easy time to be hiring for full service and or quick service restaurants across our entire country uh, when it comes to groundbreaking technology because either viewed as old school or uh, you know it's a lower revenue industry. So why focus on that when we can focus on $2 million deals with hospital systems? And I'm like, well, that's because you don't have the hospital systems if people aren't fed. So like, I, I love focusing on the hospitality service uh, in an industry because ultimately it's also a bunch of really hardworking people. Um, and it's it's a space that I respect a lot. And in about 2000 and, uh, 2019, 2020, I got involved with Seasoned. And ultimately what they were trying to do was tackle hiring uh, in the restaurant space because in the restaurant space there are a lot of factors that are kind of weighed against you that don't exist in corporate america um you know a couple of those are high turnover rate i think if you're a restaurant operator listening to this today you know that 100 to 120 percent annual turnover isn't uncommon and so if you're hiring you know you're hiring to basically fill a spot temporarily until you got to fill it again three to six to nine to twelve months later um, that's tough and it's exhausting. Um, another one of those is obviously what many restaurants are experiencing today, which is this aspect of no-shows. People who apply for an interview who really don't even want to get a job, but they're really just applying to either A, because the pandemic assistance continue to, to collect unemployment and to continue to collect additional state benefits, or you know, they're just applying to a bunch of places and whoever responds to them first, that's probably where they're going to get an interview, but it's a competitive atmosphere. So they'll apply to eight jobs, go to one interview, take the job, and then they're not letting you know that they took a job elsewhere. So you're sitting there waiting on them. Um, and then obviously the other one is just the number of positions that restaurants have to hire for at a given time. If you're hiring for a cashier, for a line cook, for um, every position that you can possibly imagine, but always. Um, some of the traditional job platforms that are out there, it's just they weren't necessarily designed with a restaurant in mind. It's because you don't see, you know, back of house workers at restaurants networking on LinkedIn. Um, there just wasn't a place for them to connect. And so season community is basically LinkedIn, but for restaurant workers. Um, the whole goal with these restaurant professionals is to have a 16 year old who's applying for their first job at a restaurant. They're able to go on there and post, hey, I've never interviewed at a restaurant before. Any tips and tricks? And suddenly they're getting a quick response from a director of operations from a local group saying, just show up, you know, show up and you know, make sure that you're showered and you make eye contact and, and just show that you want to work hard and you'll probably get the job. And suddenly the 16 year old doesn't feel alone in the industry, they feel like they have this network of support. So really by connecting the, these traditional job platforms, applicants who are on the season community and funneling them into a single button touch solution on a mobile device um, so that a hiring manager doesn't have to take time out of their day to go to a computer in a tiny little office. Um, and instead they can just click a button and accept an interview on the spot. And we're really trying to disrupt hiring in the hospitality space. And so Season tried to basically take all of the traditional job platforms, bring them into a single platform, as well as create a community of engaged hospitality professionals who view a job in the restaurant industry as more than a band-aid. So I don't know if you've heard this before, but a lot of young, specifically millennial uh, workers who are coming into their first jobs, they don't view a job at a restaurant as their career. And so there really are two sides to season. There is the seasoned community, which is ultimately the applicant facing side of seasoned. And then there's seasoned recruit, which is our product that our restaurant operators are using every single day to make their hiring decisions. Um, we'll start with the community side. 
once again, this is kind of like a LinkedIn, but but for hospitality professionals who are looking for jobs in the restaurant space, but also looking to engage in thought leadership content. Ultimately, it's a very easy place for someone in a local market to go who wants to find a quick job. They know they want a job in restaurants and they can go to season. They know they're not going to see opportunities outside of the restaurant space and they can quick apply with the touch of a button to multiple restaurants so that they can try and get an interview as quickly as same day, if not tomorrow. It's pretty crazy how fast it can happen. They ultimately get to apply with one button, which is in and of itself a massive improvement over a lot of other platforms where you have to fill out exhaustive reports or form fields, and it takes a long time to apply. You know, one of the things that we found is a lot of hospitality workers can be you know, a single mom who needs to apply on the fly. The whole goal then is to connect those who are on the community to all of the restaurants who desperately need access to the talent in that community. So the Recruit app is on the mobile devices of all of our restaurant operators. Ultimately, what happens is people can apply through the community or through traditional job platforms, and it just shows up on their app as a push notification. And it says, Mitch Young applied for a cashier role, can interview this Wednesday at 3.30. It's a time that has already been synced with that manager's calendar, so they don't even have to double check if they're available. All happens on the back end. And so all they have to do is see, oh, this person applied for a cashier role. Wednesday can come in, one to three years experience, click accept and put the phone back in their pocket. What used to be this very elongated process of going to a back office computer, having to sort through resumes of people who had just applied over the last couple of days, reaching out to them via email, text, or phone, hoping that they respond quickly. And then once they do respond, you know, a couple of days later, because they were with their grandmas for dinner, well, now you're on PTO, so you can't respond. And finally, you respond a week later, trying to schedule time for them to come in. But at that point, they've already taken a job somewhere else. And so all of that lost and wasted time for an operator is completely obliterated by using Seasoned. As soon as they do that, what you don't experience on the app, but what happens behind the scenes is an entire team of people at Seasoned who are distributed across the United States who are doing things for you, like confirming that you're, the applicant's actually going to show up for their interview, They're reaching out 48 and 24 hours prior to, and if they can't make it, assisting and rescheduling. Um, asking them questions, getting them excited with brand specific content so that we can keep those applicants engaged and try and get them to actually show up for those interviews, but without requiring any additive time on the operator's part. And one of my favorite statistics was seasoned. I don't want to sell too much here because really this is about way more than seasoned. It's just about industry trends. But our average corporate partner that we have if partnered with, we've taken the hours that an average general manager will spend per week on hourly recruiting. The average prior to season was over eight. Usually it's about eight and a half hours per week. So almost a full business day that they're spending on recruiting. And we've been able to decrease that to less than 45 minutes per week. That's amazing. And um, it's super cool that you guys are, are modernizing and making it more efficient for operators. I think we know, you know, the operators are, are working crazy hours. You know, a lot of these, um, you know, get started early, finish really late. Um, here at Choco, we, we were seeing the same things working with chefs and managers, and we're just trying to also save save people some time in, in, in the back of house, um, which also doesn't get so much attention. So I guess yeah, to zoom back out, I'm talking about just industry at large and in terms of like, you know, what you're seeing in the current job market, right? It's, it's, it seems, you know, not just in the restaurant industry, but writ large, you know, like uh, it seems like um, there's definitely um, um, uh, leverage on the applicant side and on, 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 on the candidate side of, of things. I mean, people are, uh, restaurants are opening, businesses are, are opening and there's tons of roles out there. How can, how can restaurant operators sort of differentiate themselves in terms of, um, you know, recruiting the best candidates? Um, and yeah, what are some things that you're seeing in your, in, uh, amongst your clients? Great question. And I think prefacing all of the, the responses to that, there's a statistic that is um, scarily relevant to this, and it's why restaurants need to differentiate themselves in today's market. And it's actually this number. It's, it's 90%. 90% as of right now is the national average for no-shows to interviews in the restaurant space. There are more options for those who want to be home to be able to still provide for their families and they don't have to go back to the restaurant space. So because of that, 
restaurants really have to be attractive to these applicants. And if they're not, then no one's going to show up, period. So a couple of the things that we've seen, obviously wage is really important. I think in restaurants, for some reason, I'm not even saying adjust your wage necessarily, but at least advertise what you pay. Yeah. I think in a lot of job postings, restaurants historically kind of shied away from advertising that if maybe it was 12 or 13 bucks an hour or 10 bucks an hour for a QSR job, whatever it might be, at least put it there. So there's transparency in that process. We have a couple, you know, actually Pizza Hut franchisees that all together, including tips, if you're a driver, you're making 30 bucks an hour. That's not that bad of a gig. But when you look at a position posted saying drivers wanted Pizza Hut, I'm sorry, but I'm not seeing $30 an hour unless it is explicitly clear to me in the post. If you're unwilling to post it, probably it's a good time to sit back and kind of analyze why you're unwilling to post it because there might be a deeper problem there. Uh, Another thing that we are seeing, um, you obviously get creative. So people want to understand if they're working at a restaurant, what's in it for me? Um, Not just now, not short-term satisfaction, but how does this potentially lead to a career in the space? Uh, Chipotle got a lot lot of recent publicity about this recently with their three and a half years to a six-figure management job. That was brilliant. And, And I know that Chipotle has had a surge of applications come through ever since that that happened. Um, When you lead with those things and you show that we're going to invest in you as a part of our team versus ask you to invest in us as a brand, and then we'll happen to pay you for it, then you're going to stand out from the crowd. And I think finally, I would say that making sure that you lead with the tone of your brand with a people first culture, making sure that every person who is coming in is treated as if they're the best possible employee that your brand could possibly have independent of background, orientation, whatever it might be. And if you can do that successfully and you can train your hiring managers on creating that inclusive experience once someone shows up. That is something that is so unique in restaurant space, and it can be a very inclusive atmosphere if you're intentional about it. So make sure that your brand collateral, how you're advertising, uh, getting onto um, some of the marketing, whether it's with Pride Month, whether it's with um, you know Juneteenth coming up this week, you know, make sure that you are being very vocal about these things because that will attract a younger workforce that those things are highly important to. Um, And that is part of our, and I say our, meaning the restaurant space, that is part of our responsibility to be this next wave of business operators and owners to really make sure that the right things are being prioritized so that we can create that next culture uh, in the restaurant space over the upcoming decades. The more you become a visible contributor to your local community, the more by nature you're going to attract top talent. That doesn't even mean you have to throw massive hiring events or parties. It just means be present and be active and make sure that the name of your brand is associated with doing these things. And it's not for you know that purpose. You're not doing this so that people will come. It's like, no, show a genuine interest in your community. So I think as you do that as a local group or a local brand, even if it's your block, if you're a single unit operator, well, great, find something because you would be shocked at how many times you do a, a, a dog food drive for the local you know, dog shelter or whatever it is. And suddenly there's two people who are dog lovers who are like, holy crap, I want to go work at that place. They, they care about dogs. Like, it's amazing what can happen when you show that you care about the businesses that are also local businesses. I think... Then switching to the national brand side. But ultimately, if you can start to leverage similar tactics and almost destigmatize your unit or your group of franchisees out of 1,200 units across the country, so it's not a, oh, well, that's that national brand. It's, oh, yeah, that's my jack in the box. And a lot of that also starts at the experience that you create inside of your restaurant. The four walls of your space can become a third place like Howard Schultz envisioned for Starbucks years ago where, you know, you got a home, you go to work, and then you go to your Starbucks because it's an extension of your home and your work. It's your third place. I think fast food and um, national brands sometimes forget that, that they can create the exact same atmosphere. Greet customers by name. Get to know your regulars, invest even relationally into your local community so that those who are coming in, you know, they're, you're you know, 
cashiers and your front of house people are trained on making sure that their experience is highly customized and intentional to your patrons. It's tough sometimes to focus on that when you have 20 people, you need 50, but I think you'd be shocked as you focus or refocus on the people first approach, how much that can impact uh, your hiring overall. Uh, I guess just to touch on um, just the role of technology at the large, you know, I, I know we talked about season. I know um, there's a lot of stuff out there um, in terms of um, ways to better, not just improve hiring and, and staffing, but just, you know, um, um, restaurant operations at large. I'm curious what you're seeing in terms of, you know, new restaurant technology that's available now to operators that, um, that they should look, maybe, maybe look into um, that actually benefits their business and, and not come to their bottom line. Um, I'll leave by saying I'm definitely not a, a vertical expert here. So I know some things, I know trends, uh, names I will probably struggle with just to a degree. But I think the two trends that I'm noticing are on the operator side. So from a restaurant standpoint and inside the restaurant, um, I'm noticing a trend right now of anything that can decrease the amount of time between, let's talk hiring, for instance, decrease the time from um, initial interest to actually speaking to someone face-to-face. -face. You don't want to have lots of hoops and hurdles that you have to jump through to be able to experience the magic that exists in the four walls of your restaurant. You want them to come through those front two doors. It's all about truncating that process, speed to apply, speed to get in, get them through those front doors. Um, I would say from a outside of the restaurant standpoint, ironically, it's the same thing. It's decreased wasted time. So great example, Yelp wait lists or reservation systems that are going around. Seven Rooms is a good example of this. It does a phenomenal job. It's don't require tons of time to get someone to book a table at your restaurant. Um, I, I, I guess I, the, my last question, I wanted to zoom back. Um, um, I know you also um, work, uh, you, know, you have a coffee shop that you mm -hmm. uh, own that operates in Pittsburgh. would love to hear about that story, what you guys are up to, the mission. I mean, it's just an amazing story. Yeah, so it's actually, it's a coffee roastery, uh, not a coffee shop, but you know, my, myself and our exec team at my previous venture were all laid off due to the pandemic in early March of 2020. The day after I got laid off, pouring myself a cup of coffee and thinking, all right, well, let's go see what's out there. Sure enough, there wasn't a whole lot out there for senior level uh, revenue execs at tech companies that deal with restaurants because, <laughs> well, restaurants were all closed. So one of my co-founders from No Wait, who's also a college roommate of mine, I called him up. He's like, hey, man, why don't we just try to spread some hope right now? Um, just help people who are in a similar position to you, who it seems like it's daunting odds. They're not going to find a job. But you know, I had been roasting coffee out of my garage for a while. And he's like, why don't we just start you know, basically the Tom's or Bomba's model. And for every bag of coffee that we can sell, they can donate a bag to someone who's lost their job due to the pandemic. Uh, we did one post on LinkedIn about that. And just thinking, hey, maybe we can get a couple of people from Pittsburgh to do this. Uh, had over 50,000 reactions in about a 24-hour period, which we weren't expecting at all. Um, literally at all. I had this tiny little home roaster in my garage. Uh, we had to fulfill over 180 pounds of coffee orders in about a 24-hour window, um, which for us at the time was insane because it took me 30 minutes to roast a half pound. So you can do the math. Um, caught the roaster on fire, caught my garage on fire. Uh, we decided, hey, this is a viable business. Let's figure this out. So we bought a space um, and actually then started to scale up from those early days. Uh, we learned very quickly that it was logistically impossible, if not a nightmare, to continue to track down individuals who had to prove that they were unemployed due to the pandemic to get them a bag of coffee. So we just started giving coffee away left and right. And then we actually found out that uh, a local homeless shelter uh, here in Pittsburgh, it's called Light of Life. It's the largest homeless shelter in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We found out that they were spending $40,000 a year on coffee, which is a lot of money especially for an organization that operates on donor dollars. And so we said, well, what if we just take what we're doing, partner with the shelter, and for every bag we sell, we can donate the bag to the shelter, just figure out how much they need per month. And the math is pretty simple. That means if they need X number of bags or pounds per month, we need the same X number of subscribers. And so we partner with them officially. And as of about a month ago, have fully offset their annual coffee costs. And we can donate coffee to them that is fresh roasted from a local roaster. 
Um, the next vision for this and goal is to continue to hire people from the shelter that have criminal records who largely have struggled with addiction so that we can train them on the art of roasting coffee and eventually graduate them into roasting and barista positions at local coffee shops in Pittsburgh um, so that they can kind of turn a new page in their career and get connected into the hospitality space in a way that maybe they wouldn't have before through a partnership and mentorship program. And then eventually take this across the country. Um, we have a shelter in Columbus and one in Cincinnati that have expressed interest to do this as well. So just trying to figure out the pace of that. But at the end of the day, it's exactly what I said about earlier. It's that if you show as a business that you care about the people and you want to give back to your community, you would be shocked at how many people are attracted to want to participate in that. Well, that's just an incredible story. And for those that are listening and, and would like to reach out, what's the best way to get in contact? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're a restaurant partner, whether it's local or a group, and you just need help hiring, uh, we are only in Dallas right now, uh, as well as expanding into Austin and Houston, feel free to reach out to us. Um, my personal email address is just Mitch, M-I-T-C-H dot Young, Y-O-U-N-G, at seasoned dot co. Um, feel free to email me. I'm here all the time. I'll probably reach out to you from a Pittsburgh area cell phone because uh, call me old school. I call everyone from my cell, but um, I guess that's more common these days than it used to be. So uh, happy to reach out and see what we can do to help.